All right, folks, I think we've got uh, most people join. There's a few that are still joining and we'll go ahead and uh, get them connected. But I do want us to get kicked off for, uh, for this week. And so I just want to thank everybody for taking some time out of their day to join us for um, our weekly live demo series. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over here in just a minute to my colleague to talk about uh, third party trackers and apps um, this week. Uh, but before I do so, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that we will reserve some time at the end of the uh, presentation for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put those into the chat and we'll reserve time to get those towards the end. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Himanshu, who's going to talk to us this week about, uh, as I mentioned, third party trackers in apps. With that, Himanshu, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Richard. Uh, just want to confirm you can hear me okay? We can. Great, thank you. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, hopefully your day is going well. Um, so I'm going to jump right into our next session. Um, as a overall arching theme, Data Theorem here is here to prevent AppSec data breaches. But uh, data breaches can happen in all sorts of ways. And, uh, and that's going to be uh, one of the topics that we have for today's session. So with that, let's dive right in. All right. So how does a data breach happen with a legitimate third party partner, um, whether it's an open source partner or a commercial SDK partner? So let's break that down. How many times have you heard the word open source partner? Probably never, um, or a few times, but essentially when you think of a partnership, there is data going from one entity to the other. That's exactly what's happening on your mobile apps. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And it, whether it's an open source SDK in your iOS or Android app, or a commercial third party, don't ever think anything differently. These are partners because you are sharing data with them and they are taking data with you. It's how iOS and Android, our good friends in Cupertino and Mountain View, designed the operating system. So these are partnerships. So many of you come from large or small organizations and you have vendors and then you, um, you love your vendors so much that you make them fill out you know, 200 page questionnaires about the security model um, because you wanna make sure your data is safe with them. Well, the exact same thing is happening with zero questions and zero vetting on um, your mobile apps. And that's why when I think about third-party SDKs, you really can't live with them because they're gonna, they're gonna really stress you out. However, your developers can't live without them because they are efficient, um, they're productive, and they do good work. And so I'm gonna talk about that today as it pertains to headlines. So, um, so you saw that in our headline and hopefully you saw the respectful way we use the headline um, which is directly opposite of what you see here. Um, on January 28th um, of 2020, uh, Ring Doorbell gives Facebook and Google user data. That is not really the headline that I would use. Of course, I'm not in the clickbait um, um, market. Um, and I realize the, the better the title, the more clicks. But essentially, um, Ring is a solid company. Amazon is a solid company. And you use software to promote your products and apps, right? And sometimes um, good brands uh, like Ring and Amazon um, um, have uh, negative uh, things that happen to them, but it's not malicious, it's not evil, it's just how business is done. And so that's what I really I wanna talk about today. How are good brands um, exposing themselves through uh, essentially the mudslinging campaign when um, something can be twisted around um, against them? And this article, as well as many other articles, um, happen all the time and will continue to happen because of a technical reason, not just because a reporter um, wants, to, uh, wants to get some uh, popularity. What this article states, which is my next thing here, is all technically accurate. Um, so it's not like there's anything being embellished. It's just that there's different ways to look at things. Um, so in this um, issue, Ring, has um, uh, many SDKs, including Facebook and Google. And the way the SDKs work on your mobile apps, it has the ability to be given data from the primary app uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and in this case, um, Ring told uh, this reporter, uh, Ring uses third-party services providers to evaluate our mobile app. 
which includes features, optimization, and all these things, right? This happens by everyone. It's just not Ring. Um, now, to the report or the article's defense, Ring did something, um, a pretty big oversight here in the world of CCPA, January 1st, um, 2020. Um, and just to step back, I am not surprised this article was written in January 28th, 2020, and not January 28th, 2019. CCPA here in California, or GDPR in Europe, um, and eventually it's going to be the entire United States, has a very strict but direct guideline. Like if you are sharing data about users or tracking them and their devices, you must simply disclose that in your privacy policy. As you can see here, Ring has done that correctly on Mixpanel, um, Google Analytics, Hotjar, and Optimizely. They have disclosed that, hey, we are sharing information with these four organizations in their privacy panel. This is the second um, red highlighted section I have on the screen. But they did not do that for Facebook and other SDKs. So according to CCPA, they are in violation directly, even though it's not as evil as it looks. Are they sharing network with the social networking of Facebook? No. Right, Facebook is a big company. Everyone thinks of it as a social network, but they do have software tools, free, uh, mostly free for analytics purposes to gather data. Um, sometimes the data is sensitive, sometimes it's not. Um, so in this example, everyone's kind of right, um, depending on how you look at it, but the good brands of your organizations or of other organizations are kind of exposing themselves unnecessarily unless you follow some simple technical steps as well as some legal steps to make sure you're aligned. And let me be clear, you've never had to do this before. Like with web applications, this was not an issue. With network security, also not an issue. So this is a issue within the mobile ecosystem. Um, and so, so when you think about attack surfaces, mobile has a very different attack surface. So this is not just, hey, are you using open source software that can produce security issues? Like that's in the web app world. And you know, software composition analysis that's been there forever. This is not the same thing. This is like, hey, your open source software and your third party SDK are partners. Have you vetted your partners? Have you disclosed the data you're sharing with them in your privacy policy? That has nothing to do with the source code scanning of third party code for like GLP, uh, GLP violations or, or security issues. Similar, but not the same. All right. So speaking of data share, sharing, um, this will kind of date the uh, presentation, which I'm not supposed to do, but something that, uh, that was in the news lately is uh, our good friends at Zoom. Um, and so Zoom um, had an enormous amount of success uh, because of their ability to um, address uh, remote learning and online, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, remote learning and remote work for, uh, for online purposes uh, within the past uh, few months. Um, and so one of the few things that we've collected by analyzing their apps, so they are sharing data with Facebook, with Google, and with this other powerhouse apps flyer in terms of data sharing. Now, again, these aren't the social graphs of Facebook. This is an app events SDK. That's actually a pretty good SDK to, um, to trigger or to log the events of your app. Are people using your app? Are they downloading it? Are they clicking on certain buttons? A very good SDK, nothing to do with the social graph, but yes, it is given to Facebook. Again, Zoom had uh, a plenty of issues. Um, you can speak to my, uh, my coworkers or my good friend, um, Alex Samatopoulos, who will be helping them out uh, very soon. But in this particular example, what really got them in trouble with the San Jose courts in California is CCPA. Zoom did not disclose who they're sharing data with, including Facebook. And therefore, because they did not disclose correctly, similar to Ring, they got into some, some trouble. And because of the nature of that disclosure, when you have children using Zoom in schools and data being shared with an organization um, such as Facebook, it's just an article that you don't want to be um, included in. But this particular legal case could have been um, sheltered, if not even prevented, if they had disclosed the data sharing methods in their privacy policy as it pertains to CCPA. So the good brands, you know, that's a subjective arguable term, but I would say, hey, um, Zoom, Ring, Amazon, 
They are exposing themselves unnecessarily for technical reasons that can be prevented um, with uh, sharing what you're doing and how you're doing it. So it all sounds simple. Oh, I'm sorry, um, just one more thing. In Facebook, um, everyone, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, everyone loves to talk about Facebook and its big brother and it does stuff. But one thing I will give Facebook credit, in their, pri in their policy for this app, app events SDK, um, they actually have a GDPR section where they tell the developers, you are required to obtain end user consent before sending data to our SDK. So they have gotten ahead of this too, right? So this fine print is really important, right? Now, one could say it's like, if this is so obvious, why aren't people doing it? Well, you know what? We're early in CCPA, and honestly, this is not something you had to deal with with web app security or network security. This is a mobile app security and privacy threat or attack surface. And so there's not an existing program to deal with this, um, which is why it's kind of being hidden. Um, but the people who know about it, which are lawyers, are, are standing in line to sue big companies like Facebook, like Amazon, when they infringe upon this new CCPA rule. All right, so what data was Ring sending to third parties? Well, it was a lot. Um, and here is uh, here's from our technical analysis. Um, actually, this is corroborated by the article itself. So we corroborated. The technical analysis was already done in the case of Ring. Zoom will show our own analysis. But as you can see, um, this is sensitive data. So I've been pretty fair, I think, to the big companies about um, what they were doing in their oversight. But at the flip side, if I'm a user, do I want my username on Ring, which is a home security system, being sent to Mixpanel? Do I want my email address being sent to Mixpanel? Do I want my device being sent to Mixpanel? The answer is, as a user, no, I don't. Now, it doesn't look like I have a choice here unless I read the Ring privacy policy where this was absent. But if at least if it's written, I can at least make a decision. Do I want my full name and my email address sent to an analytics company that Ring is using to, to learn about their own app? Um, same thing with Apps Flyer. Do I want my accelerometers sent to them? Uh, branch, uh, another analytics company. Do I want my IP address, my home IP address, and my unique identifier sent to an analytics company from a home security company? And of course, Facebook, the unique identifier, the device model. Am I comfortable with any of this? The answer, of course not, I'm not. Is it a security violation? No. Is it a privacy issue in the world of CCPA and GDPR? Yes. Now, I want to be clear. If you document these things and others, you are in a line with CCPA and GDPR. You just need to disclose. So the fact that you're taking someone's IP address and sending it to a third party is not the privacy issue, even though it sounds like it from the user perspective. The privacy issue as it pertains to a legal matter is that you did not disclose that. So I, as the user, as always, have to read the fine print. Um, and if I don't read the fine print, I can't cry foul. But if I do, I can choose not to install the Ring iOS or Android app um, because I'm not comfortable with a third party having this information of mine. Right? And so, uh, so this is what Ring was sending to the, to the uh, third parties. In this example, are all commercial third parties. Uh, in a second, I'll show you some of the open source ones they have. Um, and then um, Zoom. Um, Zoom, uh, with the controversy with its sharing data, for data with Facebook, again, it's the app events SDK. It has nothing to do with the social graph. Uh, let me be clear on that. But this is the information being sent to Facebook as an entity, which is, again, a advertising company, right? Um, and so whether it's Nielsen on TV in the 1980s or Facebook in, uh, in modern day, what you are looking at online is going to be sold to by a company who sells ads. Uh, it's, it's been around way before Facebook existed and it'll be, way, it'll be around in the next 50 years as well. So again, if you look at this list, um, as a user, am I comfortable? Uh, of course not. I don't want my OS version, my cell network, which basically where I'm located, my advertiser ID from my phone. Um, but again, if it's documented, I can make that decision. Um, if it's not documented, it's a violation of CCPA and GDPR. So are these um, companies knowingly doing this? So that's the question mark um, that we must ask ourselves. Um, 
And, uh, and that's, um, that's where I'm gonna pause here for a second and go to a demo. So this is our product. Um, I take that back. I'm not gonna do a demo. I pause for a second saying that I'm just using our product to, to show a point. Um, um, so these are all the third party SDKs and open source libraries that Ring Android has. Um, and this is all public information. You know, uh, you don't need Data Theorem to retrieve any of this information. It's all uh, done for you very easily by us, but this is all public. So this is what I meant earlier that, hey, these are open source partners and these are commercial third party partners. All of these are getting some data from Ring. Um, and this is the way the ecosystem on mobile works. It's worked for a very long time. Now, this is a long list. A lot of uh, apps have a long list. Now, as a user, you either download the app or not, right? Now, if I'm Ring, if I'm the chief security officer of Ring or, or Facebook, um, I need to make sure that Rx permissions is someone I trust. If uh, Z, uh, Zing is someone I trust. Um, obviously, there's Amazon, um, Crashlytics. Is KXML someone I trust? Because they're getting some of my users' data, right? And who is making this decision? It's not the chief legal officer. It's not the chief security officer. It's the developer, right? And why is the developer making that decision? Because he or she needs something from these SDKs. They're not doing it to cross stress on everyone. They're doing it because that's how you write mobile apps. You write mobile apps with your own code. You incorporate third-party code um, and you get a trade-off you for in exchange for using uh, let's just click on this this z zing identity uh, sdk it's a barcode scanning library for java so in exchange for using this i'm going to be probably or they're going to probably be taking some data of mine am i okay with that well if i'm a developer i didn't even know that was happening and i don't care because it's not my job if i'm the legal officer or the security officer I do care, and that's what's been opaque to them up until recently with all these articles and all these issues. So let's go back to the slides and talk about that. Um, as a developer, I need to be efficient, I need to be productive, I need to use standards, I am not gonna reinvent the wheel, and I'm gonna move fast. So when it comes to crash reporting, we all need crash reporting, right? If our app crashes, we need to know about it to fix it. I am not going to write my own crash reporting software when there's plenty of really good ones to use out there for free. What are the top three? According to Aptopia, Crashlytics, Firebase, and Hockey App. What does that mean? Google, Google, and Microsoft. The top three crash reporting SDKs on mobile are Google, Google, and Microsoft. As a developer, you're not going to write a better one than these three organizations, nor do you have the time. Your boss is not going to tell you, hey, spend the next six months writing something that already exists um, because we have features to get done, right? So this is the reality of why developers are unknowingly um, accepting this third-party code because they're trying to get stuff done. Okay, what about geolocation? A lot of apps depend on geolocations for, for a healthy use of a product, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm walking down the street and I want a bite to eat. And I will use some kind of app, which will tell me where I am and the nearest restaurants to my liking. So what are the top three geolocation SDKs? Google Maps, InMarket, and Baidu, right? So again, as a developer, I am not a legal officer, nor am I a security officer. I need to get stuff done. I need to make this app very popular so I'm successful. So I'm going to use one of the three top SDKs out there um, that are freely available. Now we all know what the word free and freemium means. There's an exchange, but again, the developer in their release cycle is not gonna put a legal hat on nor a security hat on. They're gonna put their feature hat on and get stuff done. And then finally, what about overall? What are the top SDKs overall according to Aptopia? Um, and here's the list. And if you look at it, it's Google, 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 Facebook, Google, right? So, so again, and there's not, that's not a mistake, right? If you're in the 1980s, who is selling um, analytics for TV home watching? Nielsen, right? So the world, this is how the world works. 
So when these articles come out saying, hey, you know, Ring is sending data to Google and Facebook, guess what? Everyone is sending data to Google and Facebook, not just Ring, right? But the problem is, is the Ring security officer or legal officer needs to say, do we trust these SDKs? And do we want to send all this data? And if so, have we documented clearly in our privacy policy in a post GDPR CCPA world? CCPA world. Now, if we documented it and our users are still not happy with it, they do have the choice for not using the app. Now, obviously, as we know as consumers, that's not much of a choice. But again, when I'm watching TV, I don't have a choice when people know that, hey, I'm watching one channel and all of a sudden um, there's an advertisement that really fits my demographic, right? Now, online, it's a little bit different, but when you're watching um, a sitcom, you'll see different types of commercials than when you're watching a sports show uh, because they know the type of people who watch those shows. Well, this is the same idea. Google and Facebook are powerhouses in that world, and they've, uh, and they've done an outstanding job to collect that information, um, sell that back to the apps that are trying to make money um, off the App Store and Play Store. So now from the developer's perspective, again, these are the things that I get bonused on. Efficient, productive standards, don't reinvent the wheel, and, and move fast. Um, and we already did the demo with ring.com. You saw those SDKs. Are those SDKs vetted business partners? Are they going through 100 questionnaires from the uh, compliance team? Absolutely not. They've been included by the developer. They're sharing data almost immediately, and no one really knows about them, which is why they show up in articles left and right. Um, the ring one I just showed you is fairly recent. There was another one last year and another one before that. It will continue happening until you kind of get your ducks in a row in terms of do you want these partners? Are you comfortable sharing the data? And of course, are they documented in your privacy policy? All right. So shifting gears now away from privacy back to security, right? So one thing um, I want to uh, double down on, and I mentioned this earlier, is iOS and Android, um, unlike what our good friends in Symantec and McAfee say, um, are pretty solid, right? It's not perfect, they're pretty solid. They have an application isolation model where one app cannot see the data of the other unless there's some significant mistakes on iOS and Android. Um, so despite them think, wanting you to think there's a big malware issue or uh, issue, the, the world of Android and iOS is not the world that Windows had back in the late 90s, right? And I think we've seen that with very few worms on mobile OSs compared to plenty of worms and viruses and trojans on, on the Windows world. That doesn't mean they're perfect, but one app by design architecturally cannot see the data of another app so that's the positive now the negative is not that's not true for sdks there is no sandbox between the third party open source or commercial code and your app so if you included the facebook sdk or the google sdk or some open source sdk it has the rights the technical rights to see the same data that you do as the app developer that includes private storage, everything in the TLS uh, network connection, everything in memory, and all the permissions the app has access to, including contact list, geolocation, SMS, photos, and so on and so forth. So thus far, I've been talking about data that you're inadvertently sending the third-party SDK. Now, what about the opposite? What about the data that the SDK is taking from your app? Not by design, but kind of a little bit maliciously or sneakily, right? Um, and here's the first, first example. In Mobi was an SDK, um, and it was fined about a million dollars because it was pulling information from the users, consumer um, geolocation data without permission. So what it was doing is a permission writing attack. Like I said here, if the SDK is embedded in your app, it has access to all the permissions that your app has access to. So even though by design it wasn't supposed to receive any data, it can take data based on your permission. So if your app needs the permission of geolocation, a third-party SDK such as InMobi can take that same geolocation data because your app has that data. So you are one in the same, right? You're the exact same person, if you will, with all the different permissions. Um, so all those third-party code, you better be very happy with them because they have the same access to data of your users that you have access to. And yes, here's an example where people use that to their advantage. Um, 
um, because a lot of people don't know this is an attack surface. This is not something you see on web or network security as well. This is one of my favorites, uh, not that I like uh, favorites with the law, but Facebook actually sued another SDK. One audience, so this is kind of turning the table. So Facebook is usually the punching bag when it comes to this stuff. So what happened is one audience was taking data from the Twitter SDK and the Facebook uh, SDK to disguise itself instead of taking data from directly from the app. So instead of, uh, so like I said, one audience, if you embed it, it would not take data from the app. What it would do is see if Facebook or Twitter SDKs were loaded and then use their kind of identity to take data from the app. So it was almost camouflaged. It was very clever. Um, I don't know if they did it maliciously or why, but it was very clever, also very sneaky. So Facebook and Twitter both found out about it and Facebook actually sued one audience um, in uh, early March of 2020 because of this issue. So Facebook was not very happy about this because obviously it made them look bad, but it really it was one audience doing these things um, without anyone uh, overtly seeing until Twitter, Twitter identified it first in November of 2019, and then Facebook sued them in um, March of 2020. Um, oops. And then um, the last example is uh, Test Fury and Glassbox. These are legitimate third-party SDKs that record your user's screen. So let me be clear. If you use this, you would be, why would you want to record your user screens? Well, if you're a software development house, your UX team wants to know how people are using the app. There's no better tool to, than watching people download and use the app to know if a new feature is working or if people find a new feature. So Test Fairy and Glassbox are legitimate third-party SDKs that will record a user screen and basically make that available to your UX team. The problem with that is, as you can tell from the headline that Apple started uh, restricting these apps, is that this data is usually stored on a third party system. And it's not necessarily disclosed to the end user that, hey, when you log into your bank account or when you log into your social network, that's being recorded and sitting on someone else's server. Like, I know Facebook knows what I have. Uh, on my Facebook account. I know Bank of America knows what I have on my bank account, but I didn't know that they're sharing my entire screen recording to some company called TechFerry or Glassbox. So Apple basically said, hey, if you're using these um, recording um, software, you need to disclose that or you need to remove it. And so they did that very aggressively. Um, not again, these, uh, unlike um, one audience, these companies were not doing anything maliciously, but also, the people using these SDKs didn't disclose that, hey, your data is being seen by other organizations that aren't Bank of America or whatever bank. That's a, just a random example. Um, and, and that's why Apple, when they found out about this, said, hey, you need to tell people or remove these recording software immediately. Okay, so how do you solve this problem, right? And, uh, and I'm going to be clear, we are a very technical company uh, with a lot of automation to offer. But this solution is a program. It's not tech. Don't try to buy Data Theorem or, or one of our you know, great competitors in this sector. We can help you. We all can help you. But you need a program behind this because there is no isolation between your SDKs and your app. So you need a program with some tech, right? And so what I mean by that is you need to inventory these SDKs. You need to know who your partners are um, because without knowing that, you're flying blind. You need to monitor their activity, and then you need to approve and disapprove that. And with this, that, that's all I have. Um, hopefully that's helpful. If you have any questions on this particular topic within your mobile apps or even APIs, web apps, or cloud security, feel free to contact knowledge at datatherm.com. And with that, I'll turn it back over to my coworker, Richard, uh, to wrap it up. Yes, thank you, Manchu. Um, great presentation. I know we're a little over time for folks, but if you've got a few minutes and you have a uh, question you'd like to answer us now while we're live, uh, please feel free to throw that into the uh, WebEx chat and uh, we'll give everybody a minute or so to do so. Uh, if not, you can always reach out to knowledge at datatherm.com and uh, we'll definitely make sure to follow up with you there as well. So I'll give everybody a minute or so.
All right, well, it looks like we don't have any questions for today, but again, you can always reach out to knowledge at datatherum.com and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may think of after the fact. Uh, with that, I wanted to once again thank Hamanchu and then again thank everybody for taking uh, the time today to join us for our live demo series. Look forward to seeing you on a future demo and thank you again. Bye.